Shalom and welcome to Jerusalem Studio. A major conflict between Russia and Turkey was seemingly averted last week when their respective presidents, Vladimir Putin and Recep Tayyip Erdogan, met in Moscow and reached a relatively limited arrangement for an immediate ceasefire in Syria's northwestern Idlib governorate. Nevertheless, to judge by past agreements, which were proclaimed but never fully implemented, the Syrian situation is as fragile as ever. To analyze the latest developments pertaining to this topic, we're joined here in the studio by Ms. Paula Slier, who is the Middle East Bureau Chief at Russia Today. Welcome. I'd like also to welcome our TV7 analyst, Mr. Amir Oren, and Dr. Chai Eitan Konya Norochak, who is a research fellow at the Moshe Dayan Center at Tel Aviv University and the Jerusalem Institute for Strategy and Security. Welcome. Thank you very much. Mr. Oren, give us a broader uh, recap on the latest developments pertaining to this topic. So it's typical for the uh, nine-year-old uh, Syrian conflict that uh, when we are talking about the latest chapter, Syria is hardly mentioned. It's two other protagonists, Turkey and Russia, uh, who were um, fighting already, even though they didn't uh, want to emphasize this fact. There were casualties, especially on the uh, Turkish uh, side. And uh, just before it came to uh, loggerheads, the um, uh, leaders, the presidents met and decided on a ceasefire on uh, joint patrols uh, somewhere, on um, a security zone, on the margins of the uh, most important highways um, crossing uh, this area from uh, northwest to southeast and, and uh, from the south to the north, from Damascus to Aleppo um, and towards the uh, Mediterranean where the uh, Russians uh, are based. And as they finished, um, um, having this arrangement, uh, President Erdogan uh, suddenly recalled that Turkey is also a member of NATO. Mm -hmm. And uh, NATO is, of course, led by the United States, which is Russia's chief rival. So Erdogan uh, flew to Brussels to ask for uh, the uh, uh, alliance's consideration and concern. And uh, just uh, to add fuel to the fire, even though the price of fuel went down recently, <laughs> Greece, another member of the alliance, closed its border so that Turkey cannot push uh, those migrants uh, who have resided in it towards the western part of Europe as a sort of leverage on the European members of NATO to come to its assistance uh, in what is happening in Syria. Ms. Lear, up until a couple of months ago, we had the warmest relations in the history between Turkey and Russia. President Vladimir Putin, of course, also traveled to Istanbul, where he met with the Turkish leader, uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, and uh, they discussed uh, various uh, challenges uh, in Libya and also, of course, the opening of a gas pipeline and, and various endeavors that uh, really uh, further bolstered the bilateral relations between the two countries. Very quickly, everything deteriorated when it came to Syria as even though the, the gas and oil lobbies in Moscow are very active and, and encourage the Kremlin to persist in their relations with Ankara. At the same time, the lobbies of defense and security highlight the importance of the strategic interests in Syria, the Takiya Tartus, Samimim Air Base, of course, and, and everything that pertains to that, which has re-emerged the Russian Federation as somewhat of an international player when it comes to regional affairs here in the Middle East. To what degree, you've been lately in Moscow, to what degree is this uh, respite that occurred between Ankara and Moscow, if, uh, if you will, I will call it that way, um, really deep-rooted in historical uh, rivalries, or is it actually just something that occurred because of the conflicting interests of Russia? I've heard it said, and I think it's a nice way of understanding the Russian-Turkey relationship, that it's a marriage almost of convenience, if you like, and that the two partners stay together because of the kids. And you talk about oil and gas concerns, you talk about trade. For example, the Russians are helping to build the first nuclear plant in Turkey. All of that is your kids, if you like. So they have benefits, but the sides don't really trust each other. They 
don't necessarily see long-term goals in the same way. And so they'll come together on matters where they need to come together. So, for example, when Russia delivered the S-400, that's um, that, that's a tick for Russia-Turkish relations. On the other hand, Russia doesn't want to push Turkey completely into the ambit of NATO, which you referenced earlier. So there'll be this bit of give and take, give and take. <coughs> and the flare-up we see at the moment has the real potential to be more than just a flare-up. I mean, that is the big concern, is that you could see a showdown between Russia and Turkey per se. I don't think that's going to happen. I don't think most people think that's going to happen. And it's in no one's interest that that actually happens. And that's why we've had the ceasefire meeting that happened now. And I think it's important to note that the meeting happened in Moscow. Erdogan would much rather the meeting had happened in Turkey. The fact that it happened in Moscow, and if you look at the body language and the photo op that was given, a lot of people say that it was really Putin calling the shots. And that if you have to, if you ask me directly, who's got the stronger upper hand here, it certainly would be the Russians. It uh, indeed uh, seems that way. And, and many people are speaking about that. Uh, Dr. Konyan Rochak, to what degree is Turkey in the place that it wants to be, mm -hmm. considering the latest developments pertaining to this issue? And we, uh, we've seen really uh, uh, an attempt of Turkey to show its uh, confidence or apparent confidence pertaining to its uh, 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 demand to be a major player in global pol uh, politics, uh, the demand of uh, being regarded as not only a regional power, but uh, part of the world powers uh, uh, in order to really uh, exercise its own foreign policy for uh, not only regional elements, but also global elements. And again, uh, we uh, heard uh, Jim Jeffrey, or sorry, James Jeffrey, Speaking uh, about uh, the the fact that the United States, uh, the U.S. Congress, and the White House are still very much concerned about the S-400 mm -hmm. surface-to-air missile systems being integrated in the Turkish uh, uh, aerial defense array, something that uh, the Turks are still refusing to even consider relinquishing in favor of uh, its NATO allies, which it so much wanted to uh, call upon. Of course, it called for the fourth charter, which uh, demands for consultations, but it also was considering the option of calling for the fifth char uh, article within the NATO charter, which would mean additional forces from NATO allied members mm -hmm. coming into Turkey. Uh, the only one doing it at this moment is Spain and intelligence sharing between the United States and Turkey. Yeah. Uh, given the high casualties uh, that the Turkish armed forces suffered, uh, from my perspective, Turkey uh, did not get what it really wanted. Uh, you know, uh, but they uh, they could demonstrate their power in terms of their abilities in the, with the uh, unmanned air vehicles. Uh, the Turkish uh, air forces uh, tested uh, the uh, the ability of the Russian uh, anti ballistic missile systems uh, by sending their uh, UAVs because the Russians closed the air, Syrian air territory to the Turkish F 16s, and uh, in the meanwhile, uh, Mr. Erdogan received many positive feedbacks at home. But on the other hand, he received uh, very harsh criticisms because of this uh, high casualties. And uh, we also understood something that uh, these extraterritorial uh, military operations of the Turkish armed forces uh, in Syria, well, uh, this time it was not the same like the previous one because uh, in the previous uh, uh, operations, we, we witnessed that uh, the Turkish armed forces did not suffer casualties, but rather the Free Syrian Army because all of these operations were targeting the PYDYPG, the Kurdish organization. Uh, so in this, um, uh, in this, uh, the, the last operation we have witnessed that uh, fighting against an organized army of a state uh, is not the same uh, like fighting with a guerrilla uh, organization. And uh, because of this high casualties, also Mr. Erdogan received uh, very harsh criticism at home. Uh, so given the fact that uh, Mr. Erdogan could not push the Syrians, uh, the Syrian uh, regime of Bashar al-Assad, uh, al to the southern part of the uh, Turkish observation outposts, uh, we can say that, you know, in a very simplistic manner, that Turkey did not achieve it, uh, what it really wanted. Uh, but again, uh, given the fact that Turkey could stop uh, this uh, offensive against the Idlib uh, city center, so we can say that, you know, partially they achieved their goal, but I think it's uh, very temporary. Uh, we also witnessed uh, in, the, in the past that... Uh, the, the two of the sides, they declared uh, these kind of ceasefires, but uh, later uh, we have witnessed that uh, this uh, conflict uh, was renewed. And uh, in order to uh, 
uh, strengthen his position, Mr. Erdogan is also using the European card uh, by opening its borders uh, to Greece. Uh, now, Mr. Erdogan is trying to trigger a new refu refugee influx uh, into the Europe. Uh, I would like to mention, and, and even I would like to correct myself, instead of using refugees, I would like to use the term migrants, because according to the Turkish press, uh, most of the people who are going to the borders are from Afghanistan, are from Pakistan, Indeed. are from West Bank, Palestinians, and of course some of them are from Syria, but uh, the vast majority of these migrants are coming from other countries, so meaning that they are not running away from a conflict in Istanbul, in Turkey, in Ankara. There is no war. It's a, this is not a war zone. So uh, from my perspective, I'm uh, just um, thinking twice before calling these people refugees. I mean, of course, they're refugees, but not like uh, refugees that, that are running away from a war theater. The majority of which uh, TV7 can confirm indeed from our sources on the ground, people who have been uh, on the borders and, and uh, elsewhere in Turkey and in Greece, uh, the majority of which did indeed come from Afghanistan and elsewhere, mm -hmm. uh, not necessarily Syrian refugees yes. who are uh, quite interested in returning to Syria after this whole situation is done with. Uh, but Mr. Oren, Operation uh, Spring Shield, as uh, the Turks called it, uh, the main objective, as also Hulusi Akal, the defense minister of Turkey, as well as uh, President Recep Tayyip Erdogan, quite clearly stated, aims to create a buffer zone in order to uh, protect the, the Syrian refugees in those areas, uh, forcing them uh, to remain in Syrian territory rather than spill into Turkey, uh, considering the fact that Turkey is already hosting an estimated number of 3.6 to 3.7 million refugees. It is quite understandable that they would want to do so. And uh, even though I do agree with the point of uh, Paula talking about the fact that President Putin is the one who's calling the shots about Syria, uh, the fact of the matter is, he did come, or President Erdogan came to an arrangement with his Russian counterpart about establishing this barrier, as you uh, correctly mentioned, the, the uh, uh, strategic highway M4, uh, where they agreed to establish a corridor of six kil uh, kilometers for each direction, which is a little bit over uh, uh, 2.7 miles. There is a lot of, of uh, uh, Turkish demands that came about. Why still is Turkey not able to assert wholeheartedly its interests in its southern neighbor, considering its power when it comes to its military might? So one shouldn't uh, confuse cause and effect here. The uh, cause of uh, what has happened uh, between Idlib and the uh, Turkish border is that uh, there is a lot of fighting between the Syrians backed by the Russians and what they, the Syrians and the Russians, call terrorists. Uh, you would call them jihadists, and um, the Turks would call them anti-regime forces. And the Turks uh, were backing those forces who are fighting Assad. Speaking specifically about Tahrir al-Sham, whose leader is al-Julani, uh, Muhammad al-Julani, who was the um, commander of Jabhat al-Nusra, an al-Qaeda-linked group, he's considered to be the number two after Adawahiri and al-Qaeda, which is an internationally recognized terror organization. That, that's true, and the name al-Julani, of course, refers to the Golan Heights, Indeed. which mm -hmm. he wants, which he wants to liberate after he's finished with his other enemies. So for Israel, of course, he too is an enemy. But if we are focusing on the, the northwestern uh, part of, uh, of Syria, um, for the Turks, it doesn't really matter uh, how you characterize uh, those uh, forces. They are against them. For the Russians, uh, these forces are right now um, uh, a problem uh, for, uh, for Assad. So they have to, to take care of them. But one should even look at it strategically. Why in the first place, first place meaning as early as the 1950s, why are the Russians so interested in Syria? Because the Turks control the uh, straits. Uh, if the Russians wanted to send their uh, squadron out of the Black Sea, they had to move through uh, Turkish-held uh, territories or territorial waters, and of course, under international conventions, the Turks have to let them move through. Namely Bosphorus. Yes, but, but if the Turks decide to close the straits against 
the international conventions, <clears throat> as the Egyptians did. It's a declaration of war. Yes, of course, but it is possible. And that's why the Russians didn't want to be at the mercy of anyone else. And they leapfrogged over Turkey to Syria for Latakia and Tartus in order to have naval bases in the Mediterranean without asking for favors or having uh, to uh, play favorites uh, with the Turks. And this has happened for the last uh, 60 years already. What is happening now is that the Russians want a friendly regime to stay in Damascus, which is why they are propping up uh, Bashar al-Assad. And if the Turks are against Assad, the Russians are against the Turks. Uh, Ms. Lear, when we're talking about the Bosphorus Strait, uh, which is very strategic, of course, if the Turks do close it, which uh, uh, crosses alongside Istanbul city, uh, this will be a declaration of war, and uh, war would ensue afterwards between Russia and Turkey, something that will draw also NATO into the picture. But, uh, of course, uh, considering the, the fragile relationship between NATO and Turkey right now, there are a lot of question marks pertaining to this. I want to ask you specifically, prior to the, the negotiations between President Erdogan and President uh, Putin, we saw uh, uh, the fact that Turkey was stepping up its efforts to raise the tolls of damage and casualties in the Syrian army in order to somehow convince Putin that it's not in his favor to keep this uh, escalation from going. But at the same time, the Russians also negotiated on the field, sending significant amounts of weaponry, uh, and uh, in, uh, which includes also uh, two frigates with uh, uh, sophisticated uh, surface-to-air uh, and surface-to-surface -surface missiles, uh, ballistic missiles for that matter, something that was also signaling Turkey that they're not going to just stand aside and, and let the Turks do whatever they want. But even though they announced about two frigates going through the phos uh, Bosphorus, there were about three to four, at least three to four other frigates that entered that strait, showing additional force to Turkey. And there was a lot of negotiation on the ground, which led to this limited arrangement between Moscow and Ankara. To what degree is Russia resolved when it comes to the situation in Syria? I think part of your question is also the question about how much of Idlib or how much of Syria is Russia prepared to have the Syrian army retake? Are we talking about the whole of Idlib or are we talking about a buffer zone there? Russia's been involved in Syria already for the period of five years. This is really the last stronghold of the rebel groups. It's the final stand, if you like. Russia cannot have it seen that the Syrian army and the Syrian regime doesn't actually win the Syrian war in the final run because they've invested so much all, all along and its reputation stands on it. Following on from what Amir said, Syria is not just about Syria. It's a stronghold from Syria to the rest of the region. It's a message to the, the international community, if you like, that Russia is a superpower. So the fundamental question is how much more does Assad want to have? Does he want the whole of Idlib? And assuming that he does, well, then Russia needs to back him to the ultimate Ultimate because it needs to actually save face in terms of what it's doing there. At in the what first expense? Place. Well, I want to go back hmm. to something you said as well. We talk about who is in Idlib. We have about three and a half to four and a half million people, but amongst them are the groups that you've referenced in terms of groups that have connections to Al Qaeda. Now, it's estimated that that's about 1% of the population. So we're talking about 20,000 people. It doesn't seem a lot. But for the Russians, amongst those 20,000 fighters are several hundred who come from Russia and who come from former Soviet Union states. And right from the start, Russia made it quite clear that one of its motivations for getting involved in Syria, aside from everything else, was also to push back the threat of terror. Russia, I don't think, is prepared to rest on its laurels until it's convinced that, that, that these people have been neutralized, whatever you want to take that term to mean and that there's no threat of them actually coming back and conducting terror on, on, on Russian soil. So that's very important for them. And it doesn't matter and how can often I, can they I use the, the terminology moderate uh, mm -hmm. uh, militias, they're not, nowhere near moderate. Uh, if uh, mm -hmm. uh, we're looking at what they've done and what they're doing right now, uh, I'd like to hear your response, but I yes. also want to hear the Turkish approach to the situation. To what degree is the Ankara government uh, persistent about uh, fulfilling its objectives for Syria, considering also the fact that uh, vocally they've been very 
adamant at uh, persisting with Operation uh, mm -hmm. uh, Spring Shield, but at the same time we see uh, on the ground they were uh, more reluctant from uh, doing so, also keeping in mind the polls that were taking place in Turkey with a little bit over 50% uh, rejecting this operation as uh, uh, useless uh, and only 46% percent yeah. backing yeah. Uh, the Ankara government uh, in this uh, uh, cross-border adventure. Well, uh, I just wanted to also um, relate to your comments. And uh, from the Turkish point of view, uh, I mean, as you already mentioned, that the Russians uh, have to get rid of all these elements. And the, from the Turkish perspective, since they have intervened in the Syrian civil war, uh, so they became their big brother of these all of these entities. So if Turkey will not protect these entities, so this... Uh, these people, these elements may come to Turkey and they may carry out some terrorist attacks. So uh, for also for Turkish point of view, it's a very uh, grave concern. It's a very, how should, how, how should, how should we say, it's a hot potato. Uh, they, they would like to hold it, but they cannot hold it. So they are trying to uh, establish a boutique, Syria, inside of Syria for, for these people. And uh, regarding your question, uh, in the Turkish social media, uh, we are witnessing that the, the, uh, the Turkish government uh, is not getting its, uh, its support that it, it, it's really desired. Uh, many people are criticizing the government because of these high casualties. Many people are filming the Syrian refugees who are uh, leaving Turkey for Europe, and they are saying, look, they, are, they, if, they, uh, they don't want to live with us. You know, uh, for the f for uh, for five years, for for six years, we fed these people, and now they are just going away. And even they are not, uh, you know, they, even they are not assisting to our Turkish armed forces in their own soils. They are uh, they would like to enjoy their lives, and instead, our soldiers are dying uh, in in Syria. So many of the Turks are very critical. And uh, from my perspective, even if the fact that the Turkish government is very much insisting on uh, achieving these goals uh, in Syria, I sincerely uh, am very skeptical uh, that it is sustainable. And uh, it is also related with the Turkish economy. Nowadays, uh, we are fighting also with coronavirus. And if this coronavirus uh, will escalate uh, and if the Turkish uh, airlines will be affected in a very uh, grave manner from this crisis, it will also, from my perspective, will have side effects on Turkish foreign policy and its uh, you know, extraterritorial. Indeed. Uh, Mr. Oren, I'd like to hear your uh, analysis about uh, this uh, specific situation. And we'll also add to it uh, the uh, element of the migrants uh, flood flooding into Europe. But I I'd like uh, for a, a short moment to touch on the coronavirus as uh, if we make uh, a certain analogy uh, to the Spanish flu, even though it's uh, uh, quite far apart about its uh, characteristics, at least at this stage, uh, the Spanish flu ha occurred during uh, a very deadly period uh, in Europe, uh, for First World War, different battles, a lot of the dead uh, in World War I, taking the combined death toll, uh, it superseded quite uh, uh, significantly the death toll uh, from all other uh, reasons of death. Um, and here also, when we're talking about uh, a situation of conflict zones, to what degree can they limit such an outbreak, uh, which could devastate uh, uh, entire countries? They cannot. They cannot contain those um, towns, cities, districts, where people are not only moving about, but running uh, for their lives. And uh, those uh, poor souls don't know uh, what to fear more, the virus or the air attacks, and sometimes the chemical attacks and um, they are uh, between um, a rock and a hard place, uh, sometimes between two uh, shelling uh, artillery uh, groups. Um, so one cannot uh, simply order people to stay where they are. And yes, uh, migrants and displaced uh, persons could carry the virus uh, into other districts, other countries, if, if they uh, cross the border. Uh, the Spanish flu may not be um, a comparable precedent simply because the public health uh, system Indeed. and medicine itself uh, have been uh, improved uh, over the years, as, as did 
uh, global cooperation and uh, cross-fertilization between uh, experts. But yes, uh, if we see uh, not only thousands of uh, fatalities, but tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, and even millions, yes, uh, it will be a major cause of devastation for mankind. About the, the migrant issue, uh, there's been uh, some contention between uh, Greece and, and uh, Turkey. Uh, for that matter, uh, as we're running out of time, I'd like to hear you, Ms. Lear. Uh, to what degree are the Greek authorities able to withstand such an influx? Also considering the fact, and it's quite interesting, that those migrants are directed by Turkish police, which uh, announced uh, uh, openly that it uh, deployed about a thousand special uh, police forces in order to push the migrants from coming back into Turkey. So they're in, right now in a dead zone, fleeing from uh, 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 Greek uh, riot police on the one hand and, and Turkish uh, special police on the other. Uh, it's quite interesting, though, that on the border of Bulgaria, uh, we don't see that many ref uh, migrants or so-called refugees, uh, as uh, uh, Chancellor Angela Merkel refers to them. Well, Greece is obviously concerned about how it's going to contain the refugee stem. What I wanted to say was, in terms of what does it mean for Russia, it's all playing into Russia's hands, because if, from a Russian perspective, the more Europe is struggling, the more the European Union is put into a crisis situation, the more refugees flood Europe, can only benefit Russia's global view. So from the Russian perspective, this is actually Erdogan and Turkey playing their card. Indeed, uh, uh, Dr. Konya Narochak, uh, the Russians are playing Turkey, also considering the fact that Turkish uh, efforts to send those migrants into Europe mm -hmm. further alienates Ankara from the West. Yes, and at the same time, Turkey is expecting to receive NATO help. And let us not forget, the same members of the European Union are the members of your uh, of NATO, so it's it's a very, uh, I mean, uh, it's a dilemma, and let us not forget also the coronavirus is uh, playing a crucial uh, crucial role here. All of which uh, we'll have to come back and revisit here at our Jerusalem Studio program. I'd like to thank you, Ms. Lear, Mr. Oren, and Dr. Konya Nowotchak for being here with us. And I'd like to thank our viewers as well, and we will see you next time. You just watched TV7 Jerusalem Studio. We encourage you to pray for the challenges raised in today's program. If you were blessed by our production, please consider supporting TV7 Israel. The details of our respective bank accounts for donations from Europe and the United States appear on the screen. Your generosity allows us to continue to serve God's calling, to broadcast content that truly matters through TV7 Israel from Jerusalem.